Joshua 2.22. The, sky, the spies return, and they have a report for Joshua and tell them that their uh, people are scared to death, and it's time to go and take Jericho. So in Joshua 3 through 5, the Israelites, Israelites crossed the Jordan into the land of Canaan. In Joshua 3, 1 through 4, the people kept their focus on the Lord as represented by the ark that they carefully followed. The ark was to lead the way. And as we talked about last time, where the spies, uh, the ten spies, lost their focus and didn't think they should take the land and knew, said they couldn't take the land. Of course, the key was God was going to take it for them versus Joshua and Caleb who had the right focus. The, this generation has the right focus at this time. Joshua 3, 5 through 6, Joshua gave orders to the Levites because of his new position as leader of the people. And now they are ready to go into the land under the leadership of Joshua. Joshua 3, 7 through 8, God promised Joshua that upcoming events would verify his divinely given authority to the Israelites. I went page 61, by the way, of the manual. I forgot to remind you of that. God promised Joshua that coming events would verify his divinely given authority to the Israelites. It's going to verify his leadership. Joshua 3, 9 through 17, God's supernatural intervention on Israel's behalf allowed them to cross the Jordan at flood stage. So when they enter in, they are able to uh, walk on dry land, much the same way with the Red Sea. And then you have the memorial stones that are placed in Joshua 4, 1 through 7. This would teach future generations about God's mighty actions for Israel. They'd be able to bring their children there. And the son asked, Dad, what's that pile of stones there? Well, let me tell you. This is what the Lord did for us. God's always giving these historical markers to help remind, help remember what has happened. Joshua 4, 8-14, through 14, the events surrounding the crossing of the Jordan showed Israel's respect for Joshua's leadership. And we're just skimming through here. We're going to dig down here in just a moment. Verse 14, on that day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, so they revered him just as they had revered Moses all the days of his life. And now that reverence is going to be tested because God designed his actions to teach Israel to respect him. They're walking into the land, and this is when the manna is going to stop. They get into the land. And. The interesting thing, imagine Joshua's going to have a test of leadership. God's going to give Joshua some uh, orders of what he's supposed to do. Again, the pagan nations knew that God fought for Israel. Look at verse 1. Now it came about when all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard. They just hear. They didn't see it. They just heard. How the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan before the sons of Israel until they had crossed that their hearts melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the sons of Israel. Remember Rahab just heard, and yet she recognized Yahweh as God. And these guys are recognizing something, and they're scared to death. And now, look at verse 2. At that time the Lord said to Joshua, Make for yourself flint knives and circumcise again the sons of Israel the second time. All right, now imagine this. Here you, Joshua, finally in the land. Finally got them into the land. Joshua hears from the Lord, and he gets his commanders together. All right, Joshua, we're ready. What are we going to do? All right, I've gotten the word from the Lord. All right, we're ready. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to circumcise ourselves. <laughs> Say, what? <laughs> yes, that's what we're going to do. Now, it's interesting that they do that in the land. They're in enemy territory now. They're going to have to trust the Lord, because on that third day, they're going to be very vulnerable. And they're so vulnerable that they could be attacked. But, of course... The enemy is melting in their hearts. They're not going to do anything. But he has to do this because it's a covenant renewal. Remember, circumcision is the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. And so it is a reminder of that contract that they have with God. So the circumcision of, the, of every Jewish male reminded them of the Abrahamic covenant that God had made with their forefathers. The manna ceased, verse 12, the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten some of the produce of the land. In verse 13, after they have been healed, they have recovered, they also observed the Passover. 
And then jo uh, Joshua was doing a little bit of reconnaissance. It says, Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho, verse 13, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So Joshua's walking around, he's looking, he's checking out the wall, checking out the city, and he just sees this guy standing here like this. And Joshua, like a good soldier, protecting, he's, he comes and he challenges him. So you force against us. And the guy says, no. Kind of answers that. Watch how he finishes. No. Rather, I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? Look at the humility of Joshua. And the captain of the Lord of hosts said to Joshua, Move your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Joshua saw a theophany there. They had the observance of Passover. That was also part of the covenant renewal. As far as we know, this was the only Passover observed since the one they did after the first one, a year after the Exodus. They observed the Passover. Joshua saw a theophany, emphasizing that the Lord was Israel's true leader. Joshua is an under-shepherd, if you will. And then in Joshua 6, 1 through 12, 24, we have the battles beginning. And we're not going to read through the Jericho account. I'm just going to summarize part of it real quick. But you can imagine, again, the leadership situation. God tells Joshua how they're going to go about, what the method is. So he comes to his captains again. They've gotten over the circumcision. They're ready now. He says, I've heard from the Lord. I know what to do. All right, what are we going to do? We're going to get together and we're going to march all the way around the wall. Everybody. Okay, a recon in force. All right, we got it. We're going to go check it out. That's fine. We're going to do it. Then what are we going to do? We're going to do it again. We're going to do it again. We're going to do it for six days. And on the seventh day, we're going to do it for seven times. You can imagine trying to sell this to these guys. They're ready to fight. I mean, they've whooped up on Og. I mean, they're ready to go. He says, nope, we're going to march around seven times, and then they're going to blow on those trumpets, and then we're going to, to borrow from Stonewall Jackson, yell like fury. We're going to shout. And then the Lord's going to fight. All right, okay. And that's exactly what happened. You can imagine the ridicule that was going on the first day. They're scared to death. The enemy is. They're watching them go around the wall. Second day, they're trying to figure out what they're doing going around the wall. Third day, they're going, hey, you guys, down there. you know, they're making fun of them and everything. And then on the seventh day, you know, they're selling popcorns and peanuts up there, watching them march around the wall down there. And then all of a sudden, they stand back and yell, and they're no longer mocking. They're falling dead to the ground on the wall. And then the Israelites come in and rout the whole place. Now, God had said, leave nothing. The whole city belongs to me as the first spoils and there's a problem because one man didn't listen to that no one can doubt that God won the battle of Jericho because it was an absolute God thing if you will God fought the entire battle although they he did allow the Israelites to go in and fight but uh, it was over the moment they shouted the walls came tumbling down the sin of one man can in fact affect an entire nation <clears throat> Achan had taken some of the contraband. You know, he coveted it. He saw it. He wanted it. And he took it. He's violating covetedness. He was stealing. And he was, in essence, making another god above God by wanting this thing. And when they went up against Ai, Joshua didn't seek guidance this time. They were confident. And they get whooped. And Joshua comes back, sackcloth and ashes. Lord, what in the world happened? He says, get it together, man. The Lord does. He says, get everybody together by lots. Keep getting it down. Do you come to the one who has sinned? There is sin in the camp. And he goes to Achan, verse 16. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near by the tribes and the tribe of Judah. And goes through and brings them down family by family until it comes to Achan in verse 19, then Joshua said to Achan, My son, I implore you, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give praise to Him, and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. So Achan answered Joshua and said, Truly I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. Now we get a picture of what it means to admit to God what's wrong here. 
He says, When I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar, it's a Babylonian robe, and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight, I saw them, then I coveted them, and then took them. Now, if he'd never coveted, he never would have taken them. Remember, that was that 10th commandment. Do not covet anything. If you don't covet, you never steal, you never murder, you never uh, take adultery, any of those things. And so now he says, I've coveted them and, and I've taken them. And behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. And they found it just as he had said. In verse 25, Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones. And they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. They raised over him a great heap of stones that stands to this day. And the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. The sin of the one man. But then, Joshua 8, 1 through 35, Israel conquered Ai. And the blessing and cursing portions of the law were read aloud at the uh, at tops of Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Joshua 9, 1 through 27, failure to consult the Lord for guidance created problems. They have to. They make a. They make a contract with someone they weren't supposed to. They weren't supposed to make deals with the people of the land. The Gibeonites come along with some deceit. They they bring moldy bread and old clothes and everything else. Say we've traveled along. We need a contract with you to protect us. And Joshua doesn't do enough research to find out who these people are. He doesn't seek the Lord, and he ends up in a contract with people in the land. And God holds him to the contract. He's going to have to bring his army out of battle and march to go and fight a battle against the Gibeonites' enemies. And this is where the sun, Joshua prays, and the sun stands still to give more daylight for them to defeat the enemy. It created problems by not consulting the Lord. Israel conquered the southern portion of the land in Joshua 10. And this is the divide and conquer strategy. Come in and take the major points so that if, if you went just started going down this way, they could consolidate and get you into a... Uh, two front war. You're going to come in and keep them from coming together and go to the south and they're going to go take the north. And as far as we know, God doesn't tell him to do it that way so much as Joshua makes these decisions and this is a good decision. Israel conquered the northern portion of the land in Joshua 1 or 11, 1 through 12, 24. Now real quickly, uh, this is sort of like that Exodus slide earlier. Here they come. They're going to fight a battle there. This is when they're fighting Sihon and Og and taking over the uh, eastern bank. So no one all, never talks about the east bank of the land. And here they're marching around the wall. See, going around, 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 around. <laughs> Watch the walls. There they go. And the city's burning. Now we'll go to AI, fight the battle here. City burns here. And we go up Mount Ebal, Mount Gerizim, up there at the top. Everybody came at Gibeon. He had to come away, bring them back over here from Gilgal to Gibeon. That's where the hailstones from the Lord stop the day so they can continue fighting. The day goes by, now they're conquering in the south. And it's just going to go from battle to battle, conquering down in the south. We'll let them get up north here in a minute. Hebron. Kabir. Come all the way around. Here we go. Conquered that. Now everybody, the coalition in the north, they come up and fight the coalition up north, and we conquer the north. We now do the in and around the Hazor, burn the city, and that's the conquest of the land. Yeah, it didn't take long. It didn't take it long to get into the land. Okay. Joshua 13, 1, 24 through 37 is the second division. Joshua divided the land among the 12 tribes. 
And we're not going to go through all of that division. We're going to make a quick New Testament connection and move on into the uh, book of Judges. But there's the division, the 12 tribes of Israel is the land divided out. Mainly we're going to be concerned about uh, Judah and Benjamin here after a while. But uh, these are the 10 tribes of the north. Two tribes of the south, Simeon, will kind of get overrun here. So these are the 12, the division up of the land. New Testament connection. Hebrews 4, 1 through 10. The writer of the Hebrews writing to believers who are getting ready to throw in the towel. It seems like these guys were priests, became believers, and they're ready to go back to the old system. And he uses the, this generation as the rest of the land. The promised land is the place of rest. Whoops, didn't mean to do that yet. I'm no, still not there yet. Promised land was not heaven, but a place of rest. Therefore, it typifies phase two salvation. It was not their redemption. It was what they were to have and what they were to enjoy in their position. But we, as believers in Christ, have a position, but do we enjoy that position? Are we living in the reality of that position? Are we entering into the rest? And God says that they will not enter my rest if they are hardening their hearts. And the writer of the Hebrews is pointing out that you don't want to be like that generation. And he also points out that the rest is not fully accomplished yet. It is going to be a rest that goes beyond just being in the land. He deals with this in Hebrews 4.10. Crossing the Jordan into the promised land typified the phase one or first tense salvation in our position in Christ. They cross in. They are now in the land. and They're not uh, going to... Uh, in their redemption from uh, slavery. They are no longer in slavery. Now they're living in the position. They're living in the reality of their position in the Abrahamic covenant just as we can live in the reality of our position in Christ. It comes from faith alone and Christ alone. Now although the believer is justified at salvation, he must conquer enemy outposts in his soul just as Israel had to overcome enemies after entering the land. This is phase two or second tense salvation. See, when we become a believer in Christ, we still have the flesh, we still have human viewpoint to deal with. We have outposts of enemy thinking in our soul. That's why Paul uses a military metaphor in 2 Corinthians 10 to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And if we're not taking every thought captive, then we are being taken captive by the empty philosophy and deception of this world, Colossians 2.8. It's one or the other. This is where Israel is going to fail. They're not going to take care of all of it. And God's going to leave the Canaanites, some of them in the land, to test Israel to see if they will obey Him. Just as we still have outposts of human viewpoint that come to test us. We have to be vigilant of rooting out all the wrong thinking in our soul. And that only comes from a con con consistent cleansing agent of the Word of God washing out the brain. Earl Rodmacher says, The Word of God is an enema for the soul. It is to flush it out. We have to allow the Word of God to flush out all the garbage in our soul. And that's what happens in phase two or first tense or uh, second tense salvation. We've talked about this before. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are regenerated. We are identified with Christ. But now we need to walk in that identification as a believer in time where we live in the reality of who we are in Christ, saying no to the flesh, saying yes to the Spirit, walking with the focus on who we are so that God is glorified, with a focus, as we saw in 2 Corinthians 5, on that future manifestation of glorification when we receive our resurrection body, when we are now finally saved from the presence of sin. But for now, we are to focus on where we are in time as far as our walk is concerned. But to walk properly, we need that eternal focus. Just as Israel had to depend on God while at the same time devising a military plan of action, so the believer in Christ must walk in dependence on God while at the same time practically applying the wisdom of God's Word to His thoughts and decisions. We are designed to think through what the Word of God says and then depend upon God and trusting Him for the results. That's what Joshua had to do. That's what we have to do. Sometimes I use this slide right here for this. The race for the prize. We enter into the race the moment we believe in Christ. 
moment of faith alone in Christ alone, we enter into this race for the prize. We are to parlay that faith into the trust of God. Pistis, Hebrews 11, 1. The, this is the hall of faith. By faith, we understand that the world is prepared by the word of God. We are to run. It's by faith the men of old gained approval. We had developed confidence. 1 John tells us in 1 John 2, 8 that we can have confidence at the coming of Christ because we know we've run the race well. We develop the agape love of God, which is manifested in love for one another. We love God. It's shown by our obedience. God says, if you love me, you will obey me. And we continue running the race for the prize, the focus on the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, the high ground of Pleroma. I press on toward the goal for the prize that God has set before us. This is the race for the prize that the writer of the Hebrews also writes about. We run that race in dependence upon the Holy Spirit. After Joshua's death, the Israelites failed to destroy all their enemies, typifying the failure of most believers to appropriate God's provisions in order to remove all unbiblical thinking from their souls. Too many believers are casualties in the spiritual life because they do not think the Word of God. Now let me show you what we have to do. This is where we're either being taken captive or we're taken captive. Here we got a guy who's uh, thinking about something. How do I know that is true? It's an epistemological question that he's asking. And he's doing it. Be, just put whatever you want over there. Whatever it is you're uh, thinking about, you can put that over in this side over here. And we all have this grid. And what we filter through this grid, this grid is built on all sorts of different things, but whatever's in this grid is going to determine whether we're going to trash what we're thinking about or store it in our soul. And we have the Bible. If we're thinking about something unbiblical and we're putting it through the Bible, then the Bible is going to say trash it. If we're thinking with the world and there's something over here that's unbiblical, the world's going to say that's what you want. Now, I wish it was that simple. Problem is we have a mix. We all have some biblical thinking, divine viewpoint thinking, and we all have some worldly human viewpoint thinking. The renovation of the soul, Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the process we want to see happen. This is what it should look like. The Word of God should fill the grid and the, and the world should start to shrink. we got news for you. All of that will never go away. There's always going to be something. We're all, and sometimes we're not even aware of it. That's the, that's the deceptiveness of it. And sometimes just little things, well, I just, I like that. I really want to hold on to that. And sometimes God brings us to a position where you've got to let go of that. And so we want the Bible to be continually increasing in our thinking so that we can think biblically and think the thoughts of Christ after Him. Now let me get a new slide up. Uh-oh. And we're ready to get into the book of Judges. If you look at that, we've covered more books than we have a whole week <laughs> weekend in this point of time now. This word starts flying. We just start moving through. We've got our foundation laid. We're moving through. Judges and Ruth. The book, Judges, is the book of failure. Sometimes they're F3s, flat-faced failures. Uh, many of them are, sadly, Samson probably being the greatest of them. The book of Judges recorded Israel's failure to completely destroy God's enemies in the land. The book of Judges recorded Israel's failure to completely destroy God's enemies in the land. Judges 2, 11 through 17, after Joshua's death, the tribes of Israel failed to finish the job of removing all idolatrous nations from the land, resulting in Israel's lapse into idolatry and repeated a cycle of sin, slavery, repentance, deliverance, and rest. This will be the, excuse me, this will be the cycle you see again and again in the book. And it's just one generation. One generation after Joshua, we have failure. As, as Brett said the other day, God doesn't have grandchildren. Christianity is always one generation from extinction. It's always got to be passed on. That's why God told parents in Deuteronomy 6, teach your children these things. The book of Judges divides into three basic sections. And the structure of the book does this for us. 
In Judges 1, 1 through 3, 6, you have an overview of the time of Judges. Don't think of the first three chapters as chronological. It's more of an overview of the time. And then we move into more of a chronological time, the description of each judge of Israel. And so we can start with Othniel and Ehud and work our way through. Shamgar is my favorite because it's just one verse on him. Makes for, now I'll show you why Shamgar is my favorite here in a minute. More than that. And then you have an overview of some events in the period of Judges. And that is some of the t most difficult pages to read through, what goes on in those sections. And the harlot being cut up and sent throughout all, you know, and just stuff like that. That's how bad it was in the time of Judges. And I would challenge you to read it and see if it doesn't give a really good commentary on our own time, in our own culture. The three major compromises are, are areas of disobedience. They're the failure to rid the land of all the Canaanites in Judges 1, 1 through 2, 5. The failure to turn away from the worship of idols, Judges 2, 6 through 3, 4. And the failure to separate from the Canaanite people. These are three major compromises that take place in the book of Judges. You can find more in there, but just kind of trying to summarize this up a little bit. Judges provides a great example of how to recognize the structure of a book through a careful reading of it. And we do this to try to uh, teach men on how to, uh, with Bible study methodology in this area to uh, when we're out uh, where they've had no training whatsoever just to kind of give an idea how to do this. In Judges 1, 1 through 2, 10, a historical summary described the basic problems of Israel immediately after Joshua's death. In Judges 1, 6, we read, But Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued him and caught, off, cut off his, caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. Now, God didn't say, y'all go after them and cut off their thumbs and their big toes. Now, why would you cut off a man's thumbs and big toes? Hard to fight without a thumb, hard to run without a big toe. It totally keeps them from being able to fight. This was a pagan practice, though. And so this was a partial obedience of the Israelites. And it produced actions that the Lord was not blessing. Judges 1 and 19, you had partial obedience. And that resulted in partial victory. Now the Lord was with Judah. And they took possession of the hill country. But they could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley. Because they had iron chariots. You mean God can't handle iron chariots? You can knock down walls and not, can't take care of iron chariots? It wasn't the iron chariots. That's there to show us that even though the Lord is with them, they're not being totally obedient and God's not taking care of this particular part of the military conquest. They, did not, they were not able to drive them out because this was the same tribe that was cutting off toes instead of doing what God had said. In Judges 1, 24 through 25, partial obedience led to disobedience. The spies saw a man coming out of the city, and they said to him, Please show us the entrance to the city, and we will treat you kindly. God has specifically said in Deuteronomy 7, Do not treat them with kessed, kindness. So he showed them the entrance to the city, and they struck the city with the edge of the sword, but they let the man and all his family go free. Now they're disobeying. Judges 1, 21, 28, 30, 31, 32, Disobedience kept Israel from driving the enemy from the land. They were not able to drive them out. Naphtali, in verse 33, did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh or the inhabitants of Beth Anah, but lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, and the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anah came forced to labor for them. Partial obedience moved from compromise with the enemy to cooperation with the enemy, and finally to coexistence with the enemy. This is very similar to what was happening when God had to move them out of the land under Jacob's boys. So we know we've got problems. In Judges 2, 1 through 5, the Lord rebuked Israel for disobedience. The Lord rebuked Israel for disobedience. Remember what God had told them. And if you guys take on the idolatry, remember the Amorites, the Ites are all being kicked out of the land because they've defiled it with their idolatry. And if you defile the land with idolatry, I'm going to spit you out of it too. Well, now we're seeing them do this. What is going to happen? Eventually, God's going to kick them out of the land, but it'll be a while yet. We're going to have to go through the monarchy first. 
they will have somewhat of a recovery. Israel's downfall begins shortly after Joshua's death. I mean, one generation, and they were going after other gods. In Judges 2, 11, 3 through, and 3, 6, this section summarized the cycle of events during the time of the Judges. And 2, 11 is the key phrase. Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And what is the evil they did? They served the Baals. Later on, they'll serve the Baal and the Asherah. So it'll get worse and worse as you go through. So the key phrase throughout the book of Judges is the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Later on, we'll see a shift in the key phrase. Israel's evil was forsaking the Lord and serving idols. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and Asherah. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers. In Judges 2.14, The anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and He gave them into the hands of plunderers. Israel's idolatry had angered the Lord, and His justice had to do something. Just as He had promised He would do. Now, that's an interesting thing you've got to think about now. What God promises to do, whether it's blessing or whether it's judgment, He does it. He never fails. You can check the faithfulness of God by His faithfulness to literally keep His Word. Just as you can check the faithfulness of ourselves in our willingness to keep His Word, to obey what He has done. He doesn't really ask us to do anything He doesn't do. He keeps His Word every time. We're supposed to follow Him and keep His Word. The Lord allowed an enemy to oppress them until they cried out to Him. And every time he, they would cry out, the Lord would answer. Wherever they went, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had spoken and as the Lord had sworn to them, and so they were severely distressed. And they would cry out to the Lord. And then when they cried out, verse 16, the Lord raised up a deliverer to fight for Israel and bring them rest. Then the Lord raised up judges who delivered them from the hands of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they played the harlot after other gods and bowed themselves down to them. They turned aside quickly from the way in which their fathers had walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do as their fathers. That's what the judge was. He wasn't like what we think of a judge. He was a deliverer. Or even she was a deliverer. He had Deborah and Barak. Israel would not learn and once again would turn from the Lord restarting the cycle. And their cycle of rebellion went from deliverance to disobedience to discipline. When the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered. But, verse 19, it came about when the judge died that they would turn back and act more corruptly than their fathers. Each cycle gets worse and worse. Othniel is going to be the best of the judges. He's going to be this gold standard. Then we get to Samson. He's, I don't know what standard Samson is, but he's definitely not gold. He's the worst of the worst. I mean, he's a brute. And so you see the decline in the culture, and it gets worse each time with all of them. Leaders often reflect. Here's a scary thing now. Leaders often reflect the people that they're leading. I won't go there, but if it was a Sunday at church, we'd probably go there. Judges 20b through 23. God tested the Israelites by not driving all idolaters from the land. God tested the Israelites by not driving all idolaters from the land. God used several nations to test Israel during the time of the Judges, Judges 3, 1 through 4. And Israel failed to separate from the Canaanites in the land, leading to the worship of their false gods. Now again, you have the key phrases dividing the rest of the book of Judges. We won't go to each of these, but we have them there for you. The key phrases, you have Judges 3, 7, 12, 4, 1, 6, 1, 10, 6, 13, 1. The sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Each time a new judge is introduced, you're just about going to have that cycle or that phrase there. And so this phrase indicated a change in cycles. We've got a new deliverer in town. And when the use of this phrase ended, a new section began. It begins here in the book. And that phrase is, in those days there was no king in Israel. You find that phrase in Judges 17, 6, 
18.1, 19.1, 21.25. In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. That's added twice. But there was no king in Israel four times. But this kind of a play on words. Was there a king in Israel? Yes, his name was Yahweh. But they were not submitting to him. And so I think Samuel is the one that writes the book of Judges, and Samuel's kind of doing a tongue-in-cheek thing there, saying there's no king on a physical throne in Israel, but there was also a king in Israel that they didn't want at the same time. And it's sort of a kind of a little phrase make you think about what he means by it. And this phrase indicated that the events of Judges took place before the monarchy, the time of the kings, and that Israel had rejected God as their king. In Judges 17.6 and 21.25, two times the phrase was accompanied by the ominous words, everyone did right what was right in his own eyes. And if that's not a commentary on our own culture, I don't know what it is. A sliding scale of values, everyone does what they want to do. You have no right to tell me what's right or wrong. I have my life, just don't, you know. That's what was going on in Judges during that time period. Now the first and best judge is Othniel. He defeated the king of Mesopotamia in battle, leading to 40 years of rest. Judges 3, 8 through 11. And he's a, kind of a member almost of the royal families. He's a descendant of Caleb. And so he has a high up in the, in the class, really. In Judges 3, 12 through 30, one of my favorite judges, Ehud. I've got to talk about Ehud a little bit. He delivered Israel from Moab by slaying King Eglon and defeating 10,000 Moabites in battle. Or, it's about lefty killing fatty in the outhouse. <laughs> Ehud was a left-hander. And this is interesting because he gets to get it. He, he evidently was uh, a leader within the Israel and he is called to bring the tribute to Ehud. And they're checking weapons as they come in. And if he was a right-hander, he would hide his dagger on his left thigh. But as a left-hander, he hides it on his right thigh. And so they're checking him, but they're checking him in the wrong spot. You know, this is the, our, our security system operating here for, for uh, the king. And he comes in to the king, and they're doing the tribute. And then Ehud tells uh, King Eglon, he says, uh, God's got a message for you. He says, all right, well, come on up to my upper chamber with me. And the upper chamber was the outhouse. Must have been big for them all to get in there, because not only is he fat, but... Ehud's got to get in there too. And he's like, what's this message you have for me? And it's like, here it is. And he sticks it into the belly of Eglon, and the fat rolls over the hand and the knife, and he leaves the knife in him, he pulls him out, and Ehud gets out of there. And he's in the water closet, in there, and they think, you know, he's in there for a while, and the service is like, wow, he must be having some trouble in there. We'll leave him alone for a while, leave him alone for a while. By the time they figure out he's dead in there, Ehud's gone. And he gets the army together and they uh, destroy uh, the Moabites here. It's a fascinating little event. I like Lefty killing Fatty in the outhouse. In Judges 3.31, we have Shamgar. Shamgar delivered Israel by slaying 600 Philistines with an ox goad. Check that out. Verse 31, after him, that is after Ehud, came Shamgar, the son of Anath. Now that's a Canaanite name, Anath, which probably means Shamgar was a Canaanite that has been, become a Yahweh follower and God uses him, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. And he also saved Israel. You know what ox goad is? It's a stick with a point on it. And he kills 600 Philistines. Whether he did it all at once or one at a time, it doesn't matter. The fact that he did it Shows that something's going on. This guy must have been some sort of ninja warrior with that ox goat. But that's all we know about him. Is that's it. We don't know any more about Shamgar, so we don't want to go any farther with it. But it's an interesting little fry. I'd like to know more about him. And then we have Deborah and Barak. Delivered Israel by defeating Sisera. And Barak is, has to be persuaded to do so. And a fun study, I wish I had time to do it, is to do Judges 4 and 5 together. The Song of Deborah with the narrative in Judges 4 really paints the full picture for you because there's more going on there than just this battle on the human plane because there's also a spiritual battle going on that Deborah sings about. We don't have time to do that, but that's 
Uh, I challenge you to try, try to do that. That is interesting. Judges 6 provides an example of letting the next form or the text form the sermonic teaching outline. When we get to Gideon, that's who is in Judges 6, and the text forms an outline for us, and we'll go through that here just real quick. In Judges 6, 1 through 6, the fourth cycle again included sin, slavery, and crying out to the Lord, deliverance, and rest. Same cycle is continuing when we get to Judges chapter 6. They'd done evil in the sight of the Lord, and this time the Midianites and the Amalekites have come up, and they have oppressed them. Oppression under the Midianites was worse than the former oppressions. They would come up at harvest time and take everything. In Judges 6, 6, Midianite oppression brought severe deprivation, bringing the sons of Israel very low. They were discouraged, and they cried out to the Lord in verse 6. Now we have a shift in what's happened. Up to this point, when they would cry out to the Lord, God would bring a deliverer. Watch what He does this time. It's a shift in how He operates. They cry out to the Lord, verse 7, Now it came about when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord on account of Midian, that the Lord sent a prophet. He had not done that before. He would sent a prophet, not, not in this way, for in the cycles of the judges, to the sons of Israel, and He said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, It was I who brought you up from Egypt. Look at that. There's that Hallmark historical event. And brought you out from the house of slavery. I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of all your oppressors and dispossessed them before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. What has he just done? Giving them a full historical reminder of who he is and what he's done for them. And now comes the exhortation and rebuke. But you have not obeyed me. And what's interesting is he doesn't tell them what it, they need to do. They already know that. They're supposed to know that. And then we move into the narrative uh, with Gideon there. In Judges 6, 7 through 10, in the break in the pattern, God sent Israel a prophet before he called a deliverer. And that's just an observation to make, and there's got to be. Some, we've got to come up with some sort of interpretation of why that is happening. Judges 6, 7-8, through 8, For the first time, God sent a prophet to Israel before calling someone to deliver the people from oppression. Verse 9, The prophet gave the Israelites a historical reminder before giving them God's message. And in verse 10, Israel was oppressed because of their disobedience to God's word. God had let them go through the first three cycles without this reminder, and now they get the reminder. And then we come to the call of Gideon in Judges 6, 11 through 16. Now Gideon is a misunderstood guy in a lot of ways. He's not normally what you want to follow in a pattern of faith. Although he is mentioned in the Hall of Faith, but only for one event as we'll see. Gideon is an example of the people of the time. He is afraid. He's down in a cistern threshing wheat because he doesn't want the Amalekites to get it. He's beating out the wheat. So Gideon's fear and discouragement mirrored that of most in Israel. But the Lord viewed Gideon a little differently. In verse 12, we have a theophany. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Well, he's anything but a valiant warrior at the moment. But the Lord viewed Gideon according to his character in the future when he would finally choose to depend on him. He is looking to what he could be. And that's some good news right there. God knows what we can be. And he's in the business of chipping off those things that are keeping us from being what he wants us to be. And we can either respond to that or not in the spiritual life. Gideon's going to try to get out of this by putting forth these excuses. Look at verse 13. Then Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? God's no longer working anymore. And where are all His miracles with our fathers told us about saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. So Gideon expressed his fear in these statements here. We have four statements that express the wrong type of fear. We looked at the two types of fear last time. He says, if the Lord is with us, here he's doubting God's presence. So God's not with us anymore. You say he's with me, he's not with us. 
Second phrase, he says, why then has all this happened to us? He's not understanding God's purpose. Because we can tell him why it's happening. They've been disobedient. They haven't obeyed God. They've been idolatrous. Then he says, where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about? He did not think God's power was relevant for his time. Doesn't think God's operating anymore. He's right there talking to God. God's ready to move. And he says, now the Lord has abandoned us. He doubted God's personal involvement with Israel. And see, here you, you've got a sermonic outline working itself out with these phrases. And then you can go and bring in other scripture and, and develop this out. In Judges 6, 14, the Lord looked at him and said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? I want you to watch what the Lord says to him now. He said to him, O Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. But the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat Midian as one man. Uh, the Lord told him, This is what you're going to do. You're going to be successful. Now, Judges 6, 14, God's answer encompasses his power and personal involvement. Points out his strength and that he has sent him, so he is in, uh, present. Gideon then offers an excuse to justify not obeying. Now Gideon says that he's uh, least in Manasseh. He's youngest in his father's house. I like to be there because he's got ten servants he can get to go do stuff with. That's pretty least. I wonder how the greatest guy had, like 25 servants? I don't know. But he's, he's making up excuses. He's not really that bad off. And then, verse 16, God answered with a promise of His continued presence. And what's beautiful about this is the Lord is answering him with the doubts that Gideon has. He is meeting Gideon where he is at. And that's a wonderful thing. But he's not compromising truth by doing that. That's a, that's a bad thing. He's not, definitely not going to be doing that. He tells him, you shall defeat Midian. And then God confirmed His promise. We probably all know about that and what happened, so we'll just quickly go through this. Gideon asked for a sign to verify the person he was speaking to was God. He asked for a sign. God gave him a sign. The Lord promised to remain until Gideon returned. Now Gideon's going to go get a lot of food in the midst of a difficult agricultural time and being oppressed and everything. He, gets a, he must send a large investment here. And in time of food deprivation, Gideon prepared abundant food to offer sacrifice to God. In verse 20, God instructed Gideon his obedience was an act of worship. So he does exactly what God told him to do. Verse 20, and he did so. He did what he was told to do. Verse 21, the Lord's miracle demonstrated his personal involvement in Gideon's life. He's right there. Judges 6, 22-23, Gideon was afraid, so the Lord calmed his fears with encouraging words. Told him not to be afraid. And Gideon built an altar. Verse 24, Gideon built an altar that still existed at the time of the writing of the book of Judges. Making this a historically verifiable account for that generation. They could go and check it out. And then Judges 6, 25-32, God commanded Gideon to deal with Israel's principal problem, idolatry. See, before Gideon can go and deliver Israel, he's got to get rid of the idolatry in his backyard. Because he's got, in his father's house, they're worshiping idols in the backyard. He's got to get rid of that. So first God commanded Gideon to remove all signs of idolatry from his father's house. And Gideon does it, but he does it at night. Not anybody knows it was him doing it. Gideon obeyed God, but waited until night. And then let's read this part right here. Verse 28. When the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar by all was torn down. And the Asherah which was beside it was cut down. The second bull was offered on the altar which had been built. And they said to one another, Who did this thing? And when they searched about and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, did this thing. And the men of the city came and said to Joash, Bring out your son that he may die. For he has torn down the altar of Baal, and indeed he has cut down the Asherah which was beside it. 
Now, Joash is going to have some insight for at least a moment. Maybe he's just trying to protect his son, but what he says is true. Watch this. Joash said to all who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal, or will you deliver him? Whoever will plead for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him contend for himself, because someone has torn down his altar. In other words, if Baal's really real, he's the one who ought to be mad his altar's torn down. Let him fix the problem. But he's not real. Therefore, on that day, he named him Jeroboam, that is to say, let Baal contend against him because he had torn down his altar. So Joash got it right there, whether he had the right motivation or not. Gideon's destruction of the idols upset the men of the city. It's a bad thing when your idol gets destroyed, when your God is destroyed, and you don't want to admit that your idol can be destroyed. The men of the city demanded Gideon's death. And Joash had the correct perspective on the events. Then verses 33 through 35, the Midianites organized to attack Israel again. It's that time of year again. Springtime, time to fight Israel. Judges 6, 33, the Midianites joined with the Amalekites to cross over and raid Israel. 34 through 35, the Spirit of God empowered Gideon, who sent messengers throughout the land to organize against the enemy. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Every time we see that phrase here in the Old Testament, we're going to see it in the Judges and a few times with, like with Saul and David. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon the person to carry out the task. And all implications are that once the task is completed, the Spirit of the Lord was no longer with them. Samson has the Spirit of the Lord come on him a number of times. God removes the Spirit of the Lord from Saul and gives it to David. David prays, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. He knows it can be removed from him. So it's a little different in the Old Testament than what it is now in the New Testament. When we get the Holy Spirit, He comes to indwell in us permanently when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is a connection to what He was doing in the Old Testament. What does the Holy Spirit do? He does through us what we can't do. The growing in grace, the producing of the fruit of the Spirit, those types of things. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and Samson and others to do what they couldn't do without Him. The first time it happened, we didn't talk about it, but the first time it happened is when the Spirit of the Lord came upon the workers of the tabernacle. It came upon those guys that were building the pieces of furniture in the tabernacle so that it would be set apart unto God, that it would be holy. All right, now we come to a misunderstood section of Gideon. Often, putting out the fleece is seen as something good. But I would challenge you to read the rest of the story, which is the first part of the book, or the first part of the section, where God told Gideon what to do. Let's just read through it. Then Gideon said to God, If you will deliver Israel through me, as you have spoken, he knows it. He knows what God has said. But if you're going to do that, Behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only and it's dry all around the ground, then I will know that you will deliver Israel through me as you have spoken. Gideon is trying to come up with something that he doesn't really think God could do. This seems to be something impossible in his mind to have a dew-wrenched uh, goat skin here with, or sheep skin with all the uh, ground dry around it. Verse 38, and it was so. <laughs> When he arose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he drained the dew from the fleece, a bowl full of water. And then we would expect to see Gideon got up and went and did what he was supposed to do. No. Then Gideon said to God, Do not let your anger burn against me. Now that phrase right there tells you that he knows he's pushing the limit. That I may speak once more. Please let me make a test once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece. You know, in case that was a fluke last night, you know, maybe it just rained in that one spot. And let there be dew on all the ground. God did so that night. For it was dry only on the fleece, and the dew was on all the ground. Gideon's not trying to determine the will of God here. Gideon's trying to get out of doing the will of God. It's a big difference. Big difference. So putting out the fleece is not how you determine what God's will is. Gideon knew God's will, but did not want to obey. We're going to find another feller like that by the name of Jonah. <laughs> Judges 6, 38. Because God's plan needed to go forward, God dealt with Gideon on Gideon's level. 
agreeing to give him a sign. Gideon changed the conditions of the sign. In verse 39. And again, God treated Gideon with grace. Gideon is an integral part of the plan at this point. And the details of Gideon, we're going to stop with that there in Judges 7 through 8. We have Gideon defeated the Midianites with God's divine intervention. But when you get to the end, they want to make him king. Gideon says, no, I'm not going to be your king. You should have the Lord your king. Uh, but I will take some of the spoils of war. I want you to make some things for me. And uh, by the way, my, I named my son Abimelech, which means my father is king. You know, there's it, something wrong with that, but this is what happened. A whole big problem comes out from under with that. Judges 9, Abimelech tried to become leader and was punished for his treachery. And then Jephthah, man, he's one of the strangest. Because he mentions Yahweh more than any of the other deliverers. And he does the strangest thing in promising to sacrifice whatever comes out the door. And he has to sacrifice his daughter. Jephthah defeated the Ammonites, but made a foolish vow to God that resulted in the sacrifice of his daughter. And then that bonehead dude named Samson. Remember, Samson was under the Nazarite vow, not by voluntary means, but God said he's to be a Nazarite from the day, of his, from the day he's born. And a Nazarite vow basically involved you don't touch anything dead, you don't have anything to do with wine or grapes, and you don't cut your hair. And Samson deliberately walking through a vineyard one day, not supposed to have anything to do with grapes. And a lion attacks him. And he tears a lion in two. He keeps on going. <laughs> no big deal, he tears a lion in two. Comes back through there another time. And that lion's dead. And in that line are bees that have made honey. And when's the last time you found honey bees in a line? There's something miraculous going on there. But he goes and gets the honey and it's sweet and he takes some through his dad. It's dead. The line's dead. He's not supposed to touch anything dead. And he takes it to his father and the text specifically says he didn't tell his father where it came from. He's making his parents unclean by giving them honey from a dead carcass. And then the strangest things start happening when he falls into lust with this woman named Delilah. And Delilah's got to deal with the Philistines. And the, Phil the Philistines, because every time Samson destroys the Philistines, he's doing it in vengeance. One time he whooped up on a bunch of them with the jawbone of a donkey. And I had missed, I'd read that passage, read that passage for years. One day we're sitting at the breakfast table and we're reading through Samson. We had these cards, we do different ways sometimes. We have these cards of... Uh, Becca puts out with different pictures and they've got Samson up there with that jawbone of the donkey just beating up on the Philistines and I'm talking about him. I mean, I'm waxing eloquent. My son Andrew raises his hand and I said, yes. He says, he's using something dead. Duh. Never had caught that. He was delivering Israel the wrong way by using something dead he was not supposed to even come in contact with. And so I, I never forget that now. I bring that in and took a five-year-old to point that out. Don't tell me they can't learn and understand. You just got to be willing to teach them. So anyway, he falls into lust with this Delilah, and he's there, and she makes this deal with the Philistines who want to kill him, and they want to find out what his strength is. And Delilah says, will you tell me what your strength is? And he says, no, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you. And she starts to cry, and that seems to be his weakness, women crying. And so he, he's more than anything else. So he says, well, you know, if you'll tie me with new cords, then I'll become as weak as any man. So he falls asleep in her lap, maybe. Falls asleep, she ties him up with new cords. And she says, the Philistines are up on you. And he snaps the cords and he starts whooping up on them. They run. And then another time, she starts crying. Well, you won't love me. You don't tell me why you, what your strength is. Well, all right. Well, if you'll, if you'll weave my hair into the weaver's beam there, and I'll become as weak as any man. So he falls asleep and wakes up and his hair is in the weaver's beam. And she says, the Philistines are on you. And he breaks through and whips up on him. You'd think by now he would understand Delilah's not really got his best interests in mind. Okay, there's a problem here. And then she starts crying. And you don't love me. You won't tell me what your strength is. All right, well, if you'll cut my hair, I'll become as weak as any man. Falls asleep and wakes up with a haircut. And he's as weak as any man. Strange thing happens to him. They take him. They blind him. He becomes a workhorse in the mill. 
But watch why he's in the hall of faith. Turn to Judges 16, chapter 28, or verse 28. They're making a big to-do, big temple, Dagon worship going on, or whatever God they're choosing to worship then. And they bring Samson in by the hand of a little boy, showing how weak Samson is by doing this. Samson's taking it all in, and he realizes where he is, and he tells the boy to put him where the pillars that hold the temple up are. In verse 28, Then Samson called the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me, and pre please strengthen me just this time. He, now what's good about it, he recognizes his source of strength. His source of strength came from God, and he knew it. O God, that I may at once be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. He understands where his source comes from, but he wants to avenge himself. That's the way Samson delivered every time, in vengeance. But God used him. And he's in the hall of faith for this one little moment of where he recognizes by faith where his source of strength comes from. And if that's not some good news right there, I don't know what it is. He just took that one little moment. Samson grasped the two middle pillars of which the house rested and braced himself against him, the one with his right hand, the one with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And we know the rest of the story. He brought the house down, killing more at that one time than any other time. Then Judges 17 through 21, Israel continually strayed from God and His commandments. And you just have examples of this with the different things that take place in that uh, section of Judges. And if you look at the last verse of the book, verse 25, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. But there's a bright spot. And that's going to be the book of Ruth. Judges clearly contrasted Israel's idolatry. Judges clearly contrasted Israel's idolatry and resultant immorality with Yahweh's covenant faithfulness, resultant grace, deliverance of Israel. Judges ends with Israel under Philistine oppression. And that will remain so really until David... Gets in on the throne. And in Judges, again, 21, 20, 25, what we just read. This concluding statement prepared the reader for the events in the early chapters of 1 Samuel. This sets, and really, it sets us up for the time of Samuel. Because timeline-wise, the life of Samson and Samuel overlap. Let me show you uh, just a part of one here. We won't take the time to go into this into great detail. But here's Samson right here, and here's Eli, and here's Samuel. Samuel is in the yellow, Samson's in the pink. So you see, there's the lives of Samuel and Samson overlapping here in the timeline. We didn't talk about Tola, Jair, and Ibzan, those guys, but there is, uh, you have to watch the chronology and you have to put some pieces of the puzzle together and it's not the easiest thing. But there's some good charts like this one that do a pretty good job. All right, the Book of Ruth, the Book of Beauty. If I'd have had some, I'd have brought them. But they're out of print right now. Uh, I have a commentary on the Book of Ruth, the Book of Beauty. Ruth 1.1a, the events in Ruth probably occurred in a 30-year period during the time of Judges. Now, we know for sure it's in the time of Judges because verse 1 says, Now it came about in the days when the Judges governed. Now, that's pretty straightforward. But some will put it at the time of Gideon. And I kind of prefer that, really, uh, as uh, uh, you have Boaz as a mighty man of valor. May have been one of the mighty men of valor that fought with Gideon. Uh, but, but it may be more toward the end, and that may be more... Uh, Probably a better position because it deals better with the chronology when we get Obed and Jesse and David. It gets us closer to the time of David. So a lot of, a lot of time factors you have to deal with there. But the book divides itself according to the chapter divisions in modern Bibles. And note how I've outlined this. Ruth 1, Naomi had a bitter life. Naomi had a blessed daughter-in-law. Naomi had a kinsman redeemer. And Naomi had a grandson, so the grandfather of King David. Why is it called the book of Ruth? I'm not real sure. It's really all about Naomi. 
Ruth's involved, yes, but Naomi is more of the focus in a lot of ways because what Ruth does is for Naomi and the situation that she's in as a uh, widow. As her husband takes her out of the land to Moab and, and she's got two sons, sickly and whiny, and uh, the father dies and the boys are married and they sickly and whiny die and all she's got left is Ruth and Orpha and uh, they um, love her but she's going to go back to the land and Orpha stays, Ruth goes with her and you all know what goes on in the book of Ruth. It's, but Naomi is really the focus and uh, the importance of the book is various uh, reasons why the book's in there. One, it's going to give us the uh, ancestry of the life of David but I think one is to show also that there were people in the time of Judges who were living the spiritual life the way they were supposed to. Boaz in particular. He was keeping the law as is illustrated by the way he treats Ruth and the way he allows for her to glean in the fields as well as others. He is keeping the law. He doesn't want to usurp the authority of the law. He goes through the proper uh, closer kinsman process the way it's supposed to go through. And the book of Ruth is a refreshing account of the remnant that remained faithful to God and His law during the apostasy and anarchy of the judges. The remnant. There's always a remnant. God always has a remnant. There's even a remnant in 586. There was a remnant in 70. There's always a remnant that are living the spiritual life, even in the church. Ruth showed that Gentiles, as non-Jews, have always been eligible for salvation. The book of Ruth does this. Because that's what Ruth is. She's a Gentile. She's a Moabitess. More importantly, the book introduced the kinsman redeemer, which is, serves as a type of Christ. The kinsman redeemer, is four points, had to be related by blood to those he redeemed. That was the whole issue with Boaz. He had to be a blood relative in order to redeem Naomi by marrying Ruth. Christ is both true humanity and complete deity in one person forever. So he is a blood relative. He is qualified in that sense as a kinsman redeemer. 1 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Secondly, the kinsman redeemer had to be able to pay the price of redemption. Boaz had to have the resources to pay the price to redeem the property in, in Mary, and also marrying Ruth. Now, Jesus Christ was able to pay the price because He is the Lamb of God, qualified to take away the sin of the world. John 1.29 The kinsman redeemer had to be willing to redeem Boaz was willing to redeem Naomi by marrying Ruth and paying the price. This was something he was willing to do. And Christ was willing to pay the penalty of sin in his body on the cross. He was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And the kinsman redeemer had to be free himself. Boaz couldn't be in debt. He couldn't be in the same situation. He had to have the, the freedom to do this. And Christ was free from sin. Because he was born with no sin nature and never committed one act of personal sin, he was qualified. We have a great high priest that has been tested and tempted in every way which we are, yet without sin. He is qualified to go to the cross for us. He is our kinsman redeemer. Now to close out just real quick, I've been saying this term, human viewpoint, let's talk about it just for a minute. You call it cosmic thinking, give it all sorts of different uh, terms. But it is built on two pillars, arrogance and antagonism toward God. Arrogant antagonism toward God. Human viewpoint is arrogant thinking and, and God makes war against the arrogant and gives grace to the humble. In James 3, James calls this type of thinking earthly, natural, and demonic. It is demonic. It is satanic thought. It is satanic wisdom in contrast with divine viewpoint wisdom. And God says He's going to make the wisdom of this world foolishness. 1 Corinthians 3, 19. We don't want to be found using human viewpoint. Problem is, as believers, we have a conflict going on in us between the flesh who wants to use human viewpoint and the spirit who wants us to use divine viewpoint. And so there's this internal conflict going on 24-7. 
Galatians 5.17 tells us about this conflict. In verse 16, Paul says, If you walk by the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. And it's a very strong negation there in the Greek with the ume and the eris. He says, It is impossible to fulfill the desires of the flesh if you're walking by the Spirit. So in order to sin, we have to first stop walking by the Spirit, which according to James 4 is a sin in itself. Since we know we're supposed to do that and we don't do it, that's sin. So we're not focusing on our identity in Christ. We're not focusing on who we are in our position in Christ and walking in dependence on the Spirit. Then we are going to fulfill the desires of the flesh. But when we are walking in the Spirit, we're walking in the reality of that identification of Christ. We can say no to the flesh. We can say no to temptation. But that battle goes on between the spirit, the pneuma, and the sarks of the flesh. The pneuma wants us to use divine viewpoint. The flesh, the sarks, wants us to use human viewpoint. One produces human good or a relative righteousness. All our righteous acts are like filthy rags to God. The other produces divine good or the fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit versus the fruit of the flesh. This is part of that second tense salvation, that second phase of salvation as we live the spiritual life. This battle begins the moment you believe in Christ. And it doesn't stop until you're out of this world. And we fight it 24-7, even when you're sleeping. Although you might not know it. Alright, we'll take a break right here. What time I want to come back? Okay, quarter till. I got 15 minutes.